So just to remind you where we were, we were talking about um, the separation test, and we had sort of gone through all the different, you know, uh, all these different cases, sort of testing for separation or whatever, right? And the the idea um, uh, of testing for separ the, the the idea was to say, do, you know, if we have changes in household labor supply, does that kind of affect the amount of labor demanded on sort of the, the household farms, okay? And, uh, and then we talked about sort of some of the challenges with some of the empirics in the Benjamin paper that you guys read for last time. So the idea of this uh, Lefebvre and Thomas paper is basically just literally kind of takes the model, et cetera, off the shelf from, the, from the, the Benjamin paper, but kind of redoes it using panel data, okay? And so, you know, why, so I don't, did we, did we discuss this at all at the end of last class? Yes, no? Yes, we did. A little bit. But not not a lot, okay. So just to sum up, then, okay. So Shara, so since, so since you answered the question, so can, why? So what was the idea of why was the panel data helping us? Sorry, Shara. Sorry. Okay. We can use specs for individuals or farms. Exactly. And why is that helping? Like, what is this sort of empirical concern that that's helping with? Mm, that there's sort of unobserved individual characteristics of households. Yeah, exactly, right? So there's unobservable characteristics. So like maybe there were people who had like, you know, really good land. Those people would have like more kids and they would also have, they'd be richer, they'd have more kids. They'd also have like more labor demand. That's kind of the unobserved characteristic that we'd be dealing with, right? So fixed effects basically allow you to, to deal with that because we can like use a uh, variation uh, over time, okay? So, so the idea is that basically, you know, we're gonna, um, you know, so in, in a very, in, if we basically ran this regression, but there was sort of unobserved land quality that was correlated with both labor demand and people in the household, with fixed effects, we're going to sort of, you know, we're, we're going to include that. It's equivalent to essentially demeaning things, and so and so that that concern is no longer there, right? Okay. So, um, so does this strike you as a more plausible kind of uh, empirical setting? Yes. No. What would you think about for this? Yes, no, more, well, clearly, clearly it's more plausible. Does it strike you as plausible? Like, is it, like, uh, so, okay, so the ideas are gonna use changes, so, okay, so, first of all, what's identifying this, to be clear, is changes over time in household composition within a given household, right? So we have to have a, a panel structure where people's, where household composition is changing, okay? And so the question is, if we get more, or, you know, more or fewer people in our household, is that associated with changes in labor demand? So, okay, so first of all, does that, someone want to argue that that's not plausible? Or what would be a problem with that identification idea? Yeah, Whitney. I think we haven't completely fixed the endogenous family size change. So, say more. So, if, for example, your household isn't doing well, you're like, my relative went out to go work, but now I need more help or something. I'm going to ask them to come home. And so now my household size has increased, but that was because. Exactly, right. Exactly. So imagine I, so, so just to everyone, if everyone heard, so basically the idea is imagine I, I have a, bait, a labor demand shock, I need more land, I invite some cousin to come stay with me, now my household size has increased. That's like a violation of this, right? So that's exactly right. So what they're going to do, um, so that's an endogenous change, right? That's what we don't want. What what would be an exot so so that's a problem. What would be like an exogenous change in household composition? Yeah. Someone surprisingly dies. What's sorry? Someone surprisingly dies. Yes, surprise deaths. That would total. That would absolutely be a change in household composition. What else? What's a more common change in household composition? Uh, unplanned births. What? Unplanned births. Yeah, unplanned births. Right. But actually, okay, so I agree with you. That's more common than, than surprise deaths, although actually I'm, not, actually I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure which is more, which is more common. Um, but is there something even more common than that they can use? Yeah. Gender of the kid. What, sorry? Gender of the kid. Okay. Potentially, if you basically think that, yeah. But I think that, that one thing you guys are forgetting is that not everyone in the household actually work, is like of working age. And that's actually what they're going to use. Right? So you guys are sort of thinking of like changing people coming into the household and out of the household, and you're right, those are the kinds of shocks that we would use for that. But like, you know, you get a new, an infant is not gonna sort of like, you know, uh, affect your household labor supply, 
right? Kids have to be sort of a certain age before they can start sort of contributing to labor on the farm. And so they're, what they're, and, and likewise, at the other end, after people get a certain age, they're sort of, you know, typically not, you know, not supplying as much labor. So what they're going to do is basically they're going to use sort of the, the, the aging of household members as um, pr sh surely predictable changes in sort of, uh, you know, in your household labor supply. Um, but changes that are uncorrelated with sort of labor demand shocks. So the, so, so, so the idea is like, even if you thought like, oh, you know, we need more kids on the farm, we're gonna have more kids, like there's kind of a time lag there, right? So, you know, we have a, you know, they have a you, kid starts at age zero, right? They don't got, start working until they're, I don't know, say teenagers or whatever, right? That's kind of when the, the you know, that shift from sort of being little kids that can't work to sort of teenagers that can work or, or adults that can work, that's kind of the, the variation they wanna use. Does that make sense? So that's what they're gonna do. Um, they also have just like really terrific data. And one thing I will mention, by the way, is this was an example of, uh, as far as I know, and, and you know, the, uh, the authors can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure this was data that was collected for a totally different purpose. Um, this was data that was collected because they were doing a long run study of iron supplementation uh, in central Java, and so they wanted to look at what was the effects of sort of iron supplementation on labor supply and, and a bunch of other things, and they had all this very rich panel data and then realized they could use it to answer this other question. And so I actually think one um, useful thing for you to think about in terms of data sources in general is that there are all of these data sets that have been collected for all kinds of um, other things, right? Someone is doing a study of thus and such and collects you know, a bazillion variables to study it. And those data sets are often incredibly rich and can be used for sort of other purposes. And so actually, um, you know, if you look, for example, in the JPL Dataverse, for example, we have lots of different websites from JPL studies. There are other sites that sort of compile these as well. And it, it's worth sort of thinking about whether or not you have data sets that can be sort of collected for one purpose and repurposed. Um, you know, I did this a bit in one of my own papers. I have a paper on social capital, for example, uh, which was sort of repurposing a data set that was used for, that I collected for sort of a study about corruption. Um, you know, so, you know, you can, you can think about sort of how these data sets can be repurpose, and I, sus I suspect there's lots of, good, lots of good data out there that hasn't been exploited, and this is a really nice example of a paper that was ultimately published in Econometrica using a data set that was collected for some other purpose. Okay, so, um, so what's the, the regression, right? The regression is gonna be labor demand on the farm as a function of number of people in the household of different size bins, um, and they're gonna control for um, uh, household fixed effects and they'll also control for community times time fixed effects. Okay, so they're controlling for the fact that maybe, you know, so, so why would you care about this if you imagine there were, I don't know, secular growth in household sizes, not that that's necessarily true, but if there was secular growth in household sizes and there was secular growth in labor demand, you'd want to control for kind of time effects too. So that's going to control for that. And they're going to parameterize this N into different age bins. And to isolate those exogenous changes, they're going to restrict themselves to households with no change uh, in, in household size due to membership because of migration, births or deaths, they're gonna just sort of look at the, the, the changes due to sort of the, the, the natural aging. Okay, is that clear? All right. Um, okay, so this is a funny regression because there's lots and lots of coefficients. Here are the different age bins, like zero to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 34, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is, um, you know, household uh, farm demand on these various things. And uh, in general, you sort of see that sort of farm demand is kind of increasing uh, as you sort of, um, uh, you know, log labor demand as a function of sort of the number of people in these different groups is, you know, is increasing for sort of all these different age ranges. Okay, fine. Um, if you use the variation from aging only, it's the, the standard errors are a little bit, a little bit smaller. By the way, and they do this separately for men and for, for women. Um, it does look like you get, you know, for example, in this age range, the 15 to 19 year olds, it looks like, for example, you're getting uh, impacts on labor demand from, from boys, but not from girls. In other ages ranges, you get it from both. Um, but the key thing, actually, of all of this is kind of these joint tests, right? So the, the, the thing you wanna do is reject, if we wanna reject separa uh, separation, we just wanna do a joint test that, that of all of these demographic variables not predicting labor demand, right? And that's what, they, that's, that's what this is right here. And so you can see they can strongly kind of reject the null of separation um, that basically, so, so on net all those 
dummies are, are uh, all those number, all those variables of the number of households of, uh, of different sizes are, uh, um, they can reject in all of that, okay? So, um, so that's kind of the, in some sense, this, this, this table of a bunch of zero p values of, of joint tests is in some sense kind of the, the, the main result. So substantively, right, it actually looks like we can, we can reject separation, uh, you know, with sort of much better data and kind of a better empirical strategy. Yeah, kind of. What do you think it published so well? Is it just like a really important question? What, sorry? Like, what, why do you think this paper published so well? Is it like a very important question or? I think so. I think that sort of we'd all been teaching kind of that Benjamin paper for, you know, since 1982 and having to complain about the empirics not being kind of up to modern sort of standards. And so having someone who can say, look, like this is a classic kind of development economics question and I'm just going to nail the empirics of that, that's a nice paper. Like I think that, that, and actually that could be like a, you know, if you can find, you know, great classic questions with kind of where the, that are waiting for kind of a good empirical test, I think that's a great result. Like I would have, I, I would have totally been happy to publish this paper. I think it's a great paper. Um, other questions? And I was so excited to finally be able to update my slides when it came out and be like, aha, we can now actually say something kind of like a little more positive about that. And so I think that's, I think that's great. You know, and, and you'll see lots of papers that have that feel of kind of like, here's a classic theoretical test and then someone's gonna sort of really nail the empirics. For example, if you think about the poverty traps section, right, there, I think Esther taught the Balboni et al. paper on the estimation of the, of the poverty, right? And that was what, you know, in some sense, what's so exciting about that paper? Well, we all knew that we could write, you know, you know, you could, we could all write, you know, do this graph of KT plus one versus KT and sort of like, you know, do something kind of funky that looked like that, but actually sort of, you know, really nailing kind of what the shape of that curve looks like and establishing whether or not there are multiple equilibria or not is something that I think everyone is really excited about. So I think that's another, that, in fact, that's another reason that paper is sort of so exciting is because like that basic sort of theoretical framework we've had for a long time but actually sort of being able to show it empirically kind of in a convincing way is really nice. Which have like a significant advance on the... I think so. Okay. On both those examples. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, the, the, the key there is finding like a classic, it's not some random theory paper that no one's ever heard of, right? You know, this is like a classic poverty trap model that everybody knows, right? This one, this Benjamin paper is something that sort of, you know, we'd all, you know, been teaching is kind of one of these key questions in labor economics and development for a long time. So coming in and sort of saying like, this is a, this is gonna be the definitive kind of empirical piece that goes along with this theoretical piece, that's awesome. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. All right. Um, so, so what's going on? So if we buy that there's sort of these separation failures, like what is going on in these labor markets? Why is this happening? Well, if you think about the theory, it said something is going on that's sort of making these labor markets not clear, right? That was kind of the key. That's why we got these separation failures, right? And so, um, so why, right? And so there's a bunch of papers that have been starting to understand like what's, like try to unpack in a little more detail, like what is going on in these rural labor markets? Why are they not clearing? Okay, so I wanna talk about a few of them. So um, in particular, I'm gonna talk about several papers that look at this idea of nominal wage stickiness. So how many of you guys have heard of nominal wage stickiness, like from macro? Some of you? Not, not, not everyone, okay. So the basic idea, well, someone, someone who's heard of it, you wanna summarize it? What's the idea? You can't adjust wages downwards or the nominal wage downwards because there's like, no people don't like it. <laughs> right, exactly. So this is the idea that there's an asymmetry in wage adjustments Everyone is happy to have their nominal wage go up. People do not like their nominal wage to go down. And for some reason, that this, this, is, a, this is true in uh, about nominal wages and not so much about real wages, right? Because your nominal wage, and even though that's sort of, it's harder for our models to think about, it is like much easier for actual people to think about nominal uh, numbers than real numbers, right? Because your nominal wage is like how much you're actually being paid like every period or whatever. And that's really important for, that is really important macro implications as you may have learned about it in macro um, because it means that sort of, you know, wages don't, you know, if there, if there are, uh, are, are shocks to labor markets, 
and you have nominal wage rigidity and you have no inflation, then basically you have all these labor markets that kind of are not clearing because you have people, you know, these wages are not sort of sticking downwards, okay? And so the, at the macro level, that's sort of often one of the main arguments why we should have a non-zero optimal inflation target, right? Because we want to have a little bit of inflation so that these labor markets can, you know, because we, if we have nominal stickiness but not real stickiness, a little bit of inflation means the real wage can sort of move around a little bit and, and those markets can clear. Okay, so you might, the a natural question is, you know, these, these ideas about nominal wage stickiness are very intuitive in sort of very formal settings, you know, with formal wage contracts, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, my wage is set, you know, MIT has, you know, sets my wage, I have a letter sort of saying what my salary is, it's kind of all kind of very, you know, by the book. Um, it's even more uh, unsurprising in cases where there are labor unions involved. Um, but it's not obvious that this would translate into kind of like spot labor markets for agricultural labor in a developing country setting, right? It's like we need to go hire some, we need to go to the sort of the, the, the village center and sort of pick up a few laborers to kind of help, you know, clear our field today. Like, is that a setting where we expect nominal wage to keep or not? Okay, and it's not obvious, right? So, um, so there's a, but you can see why, why this would lead to separation failures, right? That was actually in fact one of, so, so yes or no? Can you, why would this lead to separation failures? Okay, you should ask. You speak in the household, you don't have a formal kind of contract. Huh? In, in, within the household, you're not kind of setting a formal contract. Right, but more generally, like what's the, what's the, what's, which of the, those like various little graphs with the like, you know, with the separation failures does this correspond to? Someone? I want to take a stab at this. The market wage is too high. Yeah, the market wage is too high. Exactly, right? So we'd like the we'd like the wage to come down, right, to clear, but it's stuck up too high because of nominal wage stickiness. So it's the case where the nominal wage the market wage is too high, right? So we, so we can't get enough. We'd like more work. The households would like more work, kind of at the market wage, but they can't get it. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Supreet Kaur has a paper sort of testing this idea of whether there is nominal wage stickiness uh, in kind of rural labor markets. Um, and here's her idea. Her, her idea is very simple. If you have um, nominal downward stickiness, then, um, okay, f sorry, back up. She's, she's going to use rainfall shocks as shocks to uh, labor demand. Okay, so when you have good rainfall, we need lots of labor to sort of clear the, you know, do all the agricultural activities. When you have bad rainfall, there's not that much to do because the crops didn't grow that well, so we have less labor demand, okay? So we, so we, we have uh, rainfall shocks as a measure of labor demand. If you have, but, but with nominal, nominal downward stickiness, the sequence of shocks is gonna matter. So in particular, if you have a positive shock and then a negative shock, the wages went, are gonna go up after the positive shock and they're gonna be stuck too high and they're not gonna fall during the negative shock. Whereas if I have you know, negative shock and positive shock, I have no problem. And in particular, the key thing she's gonna look at is if I have, is in some sense, if I have a negative shock now, so I, I want a low wage now, then the lagged shock is gonna matter, right? So if I, if I, want, a, if I want a low wage today because I got a negative shock, and I had a low wage yesterday, then we're good. But if I had a negative shock now, so the optimal wage is low today, but I had a positive shock in the past, then the wage is gonna be artificially too high. Is that clear? Yes, no? Kosh, no? Well, what if, like, if, the, if it's sticky, then why would the first negative shock push the price down? What do you mean? Like, as in, if you have two negative shocks, would it first might be sticky as well, so this market's not very clear. It only sticks, it only sticks, it, 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 the, the thing isn't, so, but, it, but it didn't go up. It's almost like it did, the, the key of a negative shock is it wasn't a positive shock. That's the thing to think about. So like, imagine we're, imagine we're just sort of at some base case, okay? And then in period uh, one, right, we get just a neutral or negative shock, so there's no increase in the wage, right? So the wage is kind of over here. And in the other case, we get a positive shock, so the wage is over, over here. 
Now the next question is if we get a negative shock in the next period, right, over here it'll still be kind of the wage will be down here, over here the wage will be too high. So the key point is kind of that, that uh, if you get a negative shock, whereas if you get a positive shock in the next period, then this wage can just you know, flip right back up. So, you have this, so, so it, with positive shocks in the second period, the lag doesn't really matter. With negative shocks in the second period, then you have this persistence of the lag, that basically the positive shock means the wage stays too high. That's kind of the, the key asymmetry in her, in her test. Does that make sense? OK. So she's going to do this. She has data on like a number of years of Indian, from Indian districts where she has rainfall shocks and she has so the agricultural wage. And so th this is kind of, so she has two different, this is like from 1956 to 87, so she has a lot of years, right? And uh, this other, I guess this is from the World, from, from the World Bank data set. It's also this NSS data from 82 to 2008. Um, and so the key thing is like sh she's going to look at shock t minus 1 and shock at time t. Okay, so what are the key things we can learn from this? So first point is uh, positive shocks in the second period um, increase uh, the wage. Okay, that's not surprising. Doesn't really seem to matter what the wage was last period. Okay, so if the shock is high, this, this is all relative to kind of zero, zero, like neutral, neutral, okay? So if the wage was high this period, it doesn't matter if we were like in a drought or had a, had a high wage last period. Those are like about the same. Okay, if anything, actually, it looks a little weird over here. It looks a little negative. But certainly, it's not the case that like drought last period is kind of pulling the wage down today. Okay? On the other hand, if we have a drought this period or like a negative shock this period, the wage is higher if we had a positive shock last period. So that's what you can see, like, for example, like these coefficients compared to the, the ones in kind of this bin compared to the ones in this bin. OK? Is that clear? I know this is a little small, but it seems like you guys have all your printouts or your iPads or whatever. So hopefully you can read it, right? So that's, that's the key, as this is the key asymmetry. Is like over here, it doesn't matter. But down here, it seems to matter. OK, so the wage is stuck too high in the previous period. If you sort of take the, um, this idea that sort of this is about nominal rigidity, then these effects should be smaller if there's inflation going on. Right? So there, this is a period over a 50 or whatever, 30 year period. There's different inflation rates. So she's going to interact this whole thing with inflation. And if you remember the kind of the key place we thought there was nominal stickiness was uh, like negative shock this period, but positive shock in the last period. So she's going to in interact all these shock things with kind of an inflation measure. And the key thing she's going to find is, is a negative coefficient over here, which is basically that sort of the, this effect of the wage being too high goes away when there's high inflation. And the final question, and I don't remember why they have acres per adult in the household, actually. I don't remember that. Um, uh, but the final point is, does this actually sort of lead to changes in aggregate employment? OK. So they have a measure of sort of aggregate employment. And if you find that sort of the shock is, so in general, um, OK, so a couple things. So uh, something actually is going, something is weird with this coefficient. Uh, it's negative over here and positive over here. So maybe there's something, this, I suspect there's something off on that one over here. Uh, I suspect that's probably negative. Um, yeah. So in general, like positive shocks lead to more employment, negative shocks lead to less employment. But, but when you have a, um, Negative shock today, shock equals, like a, sh a shock equals, th th this table is a little funky because sometimes it's zero and sometimes it's negative. I don't exactly know why she does that, frankly. Um, but in general, when you have uh, positive shocks in the past period and um, negative shocks today, you get more negative effects on employment 
than if you just had um, negative shocks today. Okay, so that lag positive shock is giving you an extra bump in negative, you know, an additional sort of negative employment effect above and beyond um, uh, uh, just the negative sort of demand shock today. And that's because the price is sort of stuck too high. Right, and, and so what, what's going on there, right, we, you know, what you'd like to have happen Right, so you know what you'd like to have happen if you have a negative labor demand shock. Right, you know the the wage should fall uh, and employment should also fall, but if the wage is sort of stuck um, too high, then the quantity of the reduction in, in labor will be even larger. Right, so this quantity reduction here to here is less than here to here because you don't have that sort of the, the full wage response. But is that clear? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Clear. Okay, so at some level, I think this is actually this is a pretty remarkable set of results. If you actually step back and think about what's actually this, what's actually going on, right? What's going on is it is it you know, we have these sort of spot billed, often these you would think of these spot billed labor markets, where, um, but somehow like you know these these norms about sort of. Um, uh, not cutting your nominal wages seems to be sort of taking place there too. Okay, so so here's this is one way of showing this. They have another paper, uh, or actually, uh, Supreet Kaur and a different set of co-authors have another paper sort of looking at this experimentally, which I'll show you in a second. Yeah, Wesley, you have a question? No, comments, questions. Okay. So. Um, So that says, suggests there's sort of some, some kind of nominal wage stickiness. Another approach could be, to, suppose you wanted to sort of test for sort of these, like this, this um, uh, lack of market clearing kind of experimentally. Okay, how would you, how would you do that? Not necessarily the, the, this pattern of downward. Like one, so one of, you know, broadly speaking, the previous paper was saying, look, we're testing for sort of failures of the market clearing by looking at these patterns of, by testing for one particular one, which is these patterns of shocks. More generally, if we want to look to see whether the wage is kind of not adjusting to the market clearing level, like what else could you do? Suppose you want to do that experimentally, like what could you do? Prashant? If you can like, do a shock and then to labor demand of the supply and then Exactly, right? You could just shock labor demand or labor supply, right? So in particular, right, we just literally, if we can somehow experimentally shock this, we can see what happens, okay? And, uh, and in particular, if you think that the wage is like stuck too high, right, the key prediction is I can say experimentally shock, say labor demand, and see if the wage moves. Okay? Um, so that's what they're going to do, okay? So that's literally what they're going to do. They're going to work in uh, village labor markets, and they're going to um, randomly hire 24% of the labor market in some village to go do some work in some factory, which I think, if I remember correctly, they were using for some other paper also. Like, I think they needed a bunch of laborers to go do some things in some factory to study some other thing. I don't, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'm pretty sure this is right. And so they said, well, if we can just sort of randomize kind of where we're getting them from, getting these workers from, we can also sort of study the effect of, of this labor, labor demand shock. Yeah. How is this not like prohibitively expensive to do? I think they're doing it for like a month, and they pick small villages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I actually don't, don't, don't know the, the, the details, but, you know, I think it's something like that. So, like a day budget or something. I don't know where they got the money. Okay, <laughs> but actually, but hold on a sec. So, like, suppose that I don't know what the. So, I don't actually. You can look in the paper and see what the numbers are. But if it was, let's. I mean, I don't know. Suppose it was. Twenty-four percent of the labor market. Suppose the village had. Suppose it was a small village, a couple hundred people. So, fifty people, fifty people, and they make. Uh, I don't know what the wage is. A couple bucks a day. Um, so you know, hundred bucks a day. Um, for 50 people times uh, a month would be 
$3,000 per village, and you do that for 50 villages. It's mon that's a lot of money, but it's maybe not sort of like, you know, it may not be millions and millions of dollars. And the other point is, I think they also needed these people anyway for some other thing, okay. right? So they were sort of getting multiple, you know, they needed to hire some labor for some other activity, I think, and so maybe that's how they did that. I suspect. I'm, those numbers, by the way, are not the actual numbers. Those are sort of, you know, rough and ready calculations. I'm sure if you look in the paper, you could figure out what their, the, the, the rough number is. Okay. Um, okay, so that's what they're gonna do. So what are the predictions? Like, what, what should you look at? The way you should go up. What's that? The way you should go up. Okay, so, uh, right? So, uh, this is, so they're gonna call this a labor uh, supply shock. So, and there's going to be a negative uh, labor supply shock. So why are they calling it a supply shock? Huh? Why are they calling it a supply shock? Because we're pulling laborers. Well, so you can do it either way. It actually doesn't matter. Um, so, so you can think of there's like the weight, there's like a bunch of work in the village of like farming work or whatever, and we're going to reduce the sort of labor supply to that farming work. That's how, I think that's how they think about it. You could also think about it as like the total labor market in the village and a positive labor demand shock. It's, I don't. I don't think it's really going to matter. This is how I think they think about it. It's like so the like the this, the labor market for village farm work has just had a negative labor supply shock. Okay, right. So one view is right. We went from here to there, so the wage should go up and the quantity of of uh, labor should go down. Right. That's sort of if we're in a competitive market. Um, what else? And so if it was rationed, what would you expect to have happen? Yeah, Christine? Uh, the weight shouldn't change. Yeah, what about the quantity? Uh, shouldn't change either. Right. So if we're rationed up here, right, we're just living on the labor demand curve, and nothing should happen. Okay. So um, any sort of threats to, like, anything else that you should be worried about here? Yeah. Um, if your shock is too big, then you're no longer going to be like, constrained in the same way. Like, if you push your labor supply shock like, too far up. Yep. Right, so the shock can't be too big, right? Because if the shock is too big, then, then actually then we'll be off kind of the constraint. So it has to be, it has to be big. It, you're looking for the right size shock to be detectable but not so large that it kind of busts the, it goes over kind of that, that clearing point. That's one, that's one, number two. Yep, and what else do you be thinking about? Anything else? So um, what would happen if, uh, let's see if I can draw this right. Um, so we have an, and we had, um, so that's our labor supply shock. And we had totally, um, inelastic labor demand. What would happen there? This is. Uh, yeah. Right, so here, what's that? They would change the local quantity. Yeah, no change in quantity, but the wage goes up, right? And likewise, if I drew it totally inelastic, you could have a change in quantity, but no change in wage, right? So you might you might get one, but not the other, 
right? So we need to look at both of them. We need to look at both here because if we only looked at one of them, we can't necessarily rule that out. And what about um, what if the labor supply curve is totally elastic? Wesley, who wants to say that? No? You're thinking, or Patrick, somebody. Yeah. Nothing happens, right? So um, the, I think the one alternative, the, to my mind, the, like the one of the sort of alternative things they have to deal with is like maybe the labor supply is totally elastic, right? Because if labor supply is totally elastic, then I pull out a bunch of labor, right? But you know, a bunch of sort of people, that, that, let's say some reservation wage, a bunch of people would just enter and, and nothing would change. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And, and they have a, I, I actually, does anyone remember, sort of, does anyone read the paper and remember how they talk about labor plasticity? They, ha they have something in the paper to argue this is not the case, but I don't actually remember at the moment exactly why they, they argue this is not the case. But it's a good, they do have a paragraph or so uh, on this one. Uh, to my mind, that's the one I would sort of uh, look a little harder at. Okay, other point is, do you think the response should be the same throughout the year? So here's like the key fact, right? A key fact about agricultural labor markets is there are like peak periods and non-peak periods, right? Peak period is when we need to like plant, we need to harvest, and people are like doing a lot of work then. And then sort of like the slack period is kind of like the rest of the year. So do you think there'd be, do you think there'd be likely to be differences between these two different parts of the year? Aaron, what do you think? Would you be more likely to pick up the effect that they're interested in in the peak period? Is, like, like there's an active market for in which one in the peak period why because this is when like there's an active market for agricultural labor um, and we be less likely to be in a like, excess labor supply situation where like taking taking sorry pick, more likely to pick up which effect what do you mean uh like if we're in a slack period and there's a bunch of excess labor, then taking 24% of the labor market away is probably not gonna like, lead to a detectable effect on wages. Okay, sorry. So going back to our little like graphs, so what do you have in mind? So another way to think about it, right, is um, this is our labor supply, and this is our labor supply shock, right? And maybe this is labor demand in peak. And oh, maybe I should use different colors, huh? Maybe I'll just use different colors, sorry. Okay. This is labor demand peak. And I guess I only have two colors. Oh, oh no, we have more colors. That's excellent. Oh, sort of. Okay. And that's labor demand in the slack. And this is labor supply. And we're going to shock. And this is our labor supply shock. Okay. So in the peak period, right, like in, this is all with sort of market clearing, right? In the peak period, we're going from here to there. And in the slack period, we're going to go from like here to there. Okay, so that's all on the market clearing. Yes. Okay, so now uh, okay, everyone, see, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm just, so one assumption I've made in drawing these graphs is I haven't tilted the labor supply. I, first of all, I've assumed labor, sorry, I've assumed labor supply is the same in both cases, right? Uh, I've also um, haven't changed labor demand to make it more or less elastic in these different periods, right? You might also imagine that sort of labor, I mean, another thing you could also imagine is maybe labor demand is less elastic in the peak period because I have to, I really, really, really need to get those crops clean now, otherwise they're gonna like rot. Whereas in the 
slack period, like I have a couple of some stuff to do around the farm, but it could get done now, it could get done later, like whatever. And so that would make it kind of more elastic in the uh, in the in the in the peak period. But just for the moment, with this, with this graph like this, does, does that give you any thoughts on sort of how things should be changed? Like or whether you expect anything different in the peak or the slack period? Yeah, Whitney. Oh, uh, Jenny, sorry. If you are thinking about rationing being like a price floor, you're more likely to have that be the case in the slack season. Yeah, exactly, right? So if we draw the uh, rationing thing to be, say, you know, suppose, for example, um, sorry, let's draw it. Uh, bum. Let me redraw it a little bit. Um, yeah, let's draw it over here. OK. And let's put the wage floor there. Right? So if that's the graph, hopefully you all can, can see my graph. Right? In, in, if we have a, the, the, the wage in general is going to be much higher in the peak season, right? And if I just fix a kind of nominal wage floor, then in this example, in the peak season, like everything behaves kind of nice and competitively, like the, the wage goes up, quantity goes down, because we're kind of above that wage floor. But in the slack season, right, we're kind of, the whole activity is kind of happening below that wage floor, and sort of it looks as if we're kind of rationing. And that, this is going to be basically what they're going to argue is sort of happening. Is that clear? OK. So this is how they, um, so this is, this is basically just showing you. This is what I just drew. So I'm going to say that. OK, fine. So what they're going to then do is they're going to then look at the, the hiring shock, right? That's sort of the, the negative labor supply reduction, interact with sort of whether you're at a, uh, in the peak period. And they can measure this just sort of by, by your being in the peak agricultural period in these areas or by just sort of the overall employment level as a measure of sort of like how high labor demand is. So the, okay, the first thing they're going to do, they're going to look at what they call the spillover sample. So what is this? So what they do, and this is actually sort of, I think, I just want to, actually this is kind of clever. Or, so, so what they do is they, you have to keep track of who's who in these different labor markets. So what they do is before they start, they recruit a list of workers who are interested in their factory jobs. Okay, that's going to be the potential treatment set. And they randomly pick which villages they're going to hire from. And within villages, they randomly pick people from this list. The spillover sample is everyone who is not in this list, who did not say they were interested in one of these jobs. And what, and, and, and the point, that I want to make is because they recruited this list ex ante before they randomize, they know who is in the spillover sample in both treatment and control villages kind of identically. Because like step one is I split the villages into like, you know, say this half of the villages, like if you're a treatment area, we're going to like give you factory work. This half of the village, like if you were in the treatment area, we're not going to give you factory work, right? And we know who you are because you identify yourself beforehand. And then when I randomize you into the, into the experiment later on, it's then totally okay for me to just look at this set of people in kind of control, in control treatment areas as the, as the sort of kind of rest of the labor market because I identified them identically in treatment and control areas. If I, if I hadn't done this step, I, it would still be okay to look at the total labor market, but I couldn't sort of just specifically look at what's happening to this other set of workers because I wouldn't know like in the treatment area, like in the control areas, who would have been the people who would have taken on the factory job and who wouldn't have been the people. Do you, you see what I'm saying? So the fact that this is all kind of very precise uh, and done ex ante um, is very helpful. OK. Clear? OK. So they're first going to look at the spillover sample. Um, one thing you should know about, by the way, is that you know, rural wages often take the form of like a bit of wage and a bit of in-kind. Like they'll, they'll give you some cash, and then maybe they'll give you lunch you know, or something like that. So you actually have to be, and actually for a, you know, a rural laborer making subsistence wage, lunch can be a non-trivial fraction of the total compensation. So you have to be careful to sort of measure that uh, too. 
like lunch and snacks. I feel like in one case it was like, I studied it was like lunch, a snack, and a couple cigarettes. It was like, you know, but that stuff actually can be non-trivial sort of relative to the total compensation, so you have to conclude it too. Okay, so in this spillover sample, what do you find? So, okay, someone want to interpret what we're finding here? Wait, sorry, what's that? The, the, the shock, the supply shock has very little impact on wages in off peak and that's stronger effect in the semi peak. Right. I don't remember why it's called semi peak. Let's just call it peak. Um, so, what do you make of that? Um, it seems consistent with. Or a nice little graph over there. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right? So, okay, so that's, number, that's on wages, right? And so, exactly, so that's exactly what you went. You were to, that's exactly kind of this point over here, which is in the non-peak period, it looks like they're, they're constrained, like the, the wage is unaffected. In the peak period, the wage is affected, right? And the second thing is we want to look at employment, right? So this is still the spillover sample. Uh, ignore, ignore this bullet point. I changed the graph and didn't change the bullet, so just ignore that. Um, so this is the... Uh, um, Okay, so sorry. So what do you make of what, what do you make of this? This is employment from the spillover sample. Decrease in employment during the peak season and less of a decrease in employment during the off season. Uh, say it again. Sorry, let's say that again. So. Uh, the uh, firing shock in the spillover sample causes less of a decrease in employment during the off-peak season than during the semi-peak season. Uh, not quite. So I, I think so. You're right that there's a there's an interaction effect, but the main effect you should I think you're interpreting the wrong way. So it's it's positive in the in the off peak season, yeah. right? So, so the way so employment goes up in the off peak season, and in the in the peak season doesn't change. Yeah. Does everyone see that? Right. So for the for the off peak season, it's just positive, whatever six percent, seven percent. For the non peak season, it's basically zero because we add these two things. I'm sorry. For the peak season, it's basically zero. Yeah. We add these two things. Right. Okay. So. Uh, what is that telling us vis-a-vis -vis the model over there? Is that consistent, not consistent? Let me show you one more thing, okay? The one more piece and then we'll put it all together. Okay, this one is actually a little harder to think about because this is, this is the spillover. This is what's happening just to the spillover. I, sorry, I almost lasered you guys. <laughs> to the spillover sample, right? The people over there who, who, right? who, who were not potentially included in the hiring sample. Okay. Um, this is total employment. So now we're just going to pool the whole village together. Okay, and what do, so, and, and what do we learn from this? from the uh, spillover sample? Are this is everything. This is everybody. Right, right. But does this mean that individuals in the spillover sample uh, increase their labor supply when the shock took place? Yeah, okay. First, first, before we try to interpret what this means, like, what is this, what is this table telling us? Just like, before, like, it may have been easier, actually, if I started with this one before the spillover sample. So let's take the wage results, fine. No effect in the peak period, in the slack period, big positive effect in the, in the peak period. And now it's like a total of quantities. And what do we find? Hazel, what do you think? No effect in the off peak and then later, total labor supply going down. And what's that? Total labor supply going down at the peak. Right. 
t total right quantity goes down right in the, in the peak season right okay so what is this telling us is that consistent with that or not that's consistent with the left hand exactly it's exactly consistent with the left hand graph so then so so right so what have we seen so in the non peak period in the peak period in the non peak period we're like stuck over here nothing happens in the peak period like it's going up okay so in some sense, these two results are the key results. So why look, what is a spillover result telling us? Well, you might have just thought, like, may, like, who, like something weird is happening in these labor markets. Nothing's going on, like, like nothing doing in kind of the slack period. What's nice about this spillover result is it says, actually, no, no, no. In the spillover sample, in the, in the non-peak period, what do we expect to happen? Well, we expect we just took a bunch of people out of the labor market, out of this, out of this role of labor market. Some of them were working, right? The total quantity, of the, the, the total sort of people working in this labor market uh, um, should be unchanged, right? Therefore, we have to pull in some of those spillover people have to kind of come and take those jobs. So that's kind of just the final sort of piece that's showing you that something's actually happening in this period. Is that clear? Yeah, Whitney. So when you're actually designing this experiment and then you want to get this effect in the end, how do you know that like 24% is the number of people that you need to be pulling to get this? Good question. Um, so how do you know it's a, it, this is a big enough effect? Um, well, so you, you, the answer is you would do a power calculation, right? So you would say like, um, so you don't know. I mean, you don't fully know. And actually, I would love to hear the author's answer to that question of what exactly they did. Uh, I suspect the truth was it was the big enough shock they could afford. <laughs> um, I, if you actually asked, like, the, I expect that's what's going on. But I think you can actually do, do a little more. So you can say, well, look, we know you can calculate, um, so what can you do? So you can calculate, uh, if you have some estimate for the slope of the labor supply and labor demand curves, right, you can say if I shock labor supply by 24%, <coughs> how large an effect would I expect on wages and how large an effect I would expect on quantities, right? That's just, you know, uh, you have the, 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 these elasticities, so you know the percent change in, in uh, so whatever, if I have a 24% reduction in labor supply, and um, you know a labor demand elasticity of you know whatever I can sort of multiply you know the labor supply and elasticity times the times the percent shock or divide it and you know figure out kind of how big a expected change you're going to get. So what I would do if I was designing the experiment is I would a come up with my favorite labor supply demand elasticity from some other estimate or at least try to get it from somewhere. Right. And I guess you also need the labor supply. You need both of these estimates. So take your favorite of these estimates, right? Um, you would, oh no, sorry. Mostly you just need the, the, the labor demand elasticity. I would take my favorite estimate. I would multiply it by 24%, right? To figure out how big a change in wages or quantities I'd likely to be expected to get. And the second thing I would do is I would then do a power calculation and say, well, you know, I'm gonna measure wages in this village in the and quantities in the following way. I can get some estimate from some other data set that I've done of kind of what the standard errors are likely to be in this regression, right? And I can put those two things together and say, what is the, you know, I expect to find sort of a difference in the wages between these two periods of, you know, say 7% based on sort of my best estimates of my, of those elasticities and the size of the shock, you know, what's the probability I could detect that given the expected standard errors I'm going to find? And that's what a power calculation exactly does. So. That's how you would do it. Now, that requires two things. It requires having the correct estimate of, the, of those elasticities, or at least a, something that's in the ballpark. But even if you don't get it exactly right, you can kind of get, you know, these power calculations are never perfect, uh, but you can at least get in the rough ballpark, right? And it also requires having some estimate of what these standard errors are gonna look like, and that's gonna depend on sort of the data generating process and what your sample looks like and so on and so forth. But you can, you know, if you've done other sort of samples of wages in these areas, you could do a pilot survey to sort of get some of that data and you, and you use that. So that's actually how you, would, how you would do that. 
sorry, uh, Paolo, you had another question. Yeah, I just have a very quick clarification question. What is employment level here in these tables? Uh, so I, I, actually, I, I will tell you, I don't remember exactly, but I believe it's a measure of total aggregate employment in the, in the village in that month as a way of, um, as an alternative measure of measuring whether the peak season or not. Like basically, so one is we can define peak season based on season. The other is we can define it kind of based on the, on Q, and so they're defining it on Q. I don't remember the exact definition they use of Q, but that's the idea. I think I'm still confused about why it's important to distinguish the spiller food group from people who don't get the job but were interested, unless you're worried about composition effects. So, the, so there could be, so for so imagine that there are, um, so for wages, wages is the easiest case. Wages, is e wages, it's easier to see why you want to do that. Imagine that we have like good workers and bad work, good agricultural workers and bad agricultural workers. So the agricultural, good agricultural workers are the ones who are doing the job kind of in, in general, right? Imagine I just take a bunch of those good agricultural workers and sort of select them out. They're gonna be replaced with sort of lower quality agricultural workers. If I'm measuring the wage kind of not particular, like the wage I'm gonna measure might be your average kind of marginal product. If I replace good workers with bad workers, the wage is gonna fall not because of these effects, but just because I've like moved to kind of having worse quality workers who are being paid kind of, you know, uh, based on their marginal, lower marginal products. So the, the reason we're doing it on the spillover sample is we're sort of conditioning on sort of the same set of people. Um, it's not perfect, actually, now that I think about it, um, because you're sort of getting different, you're still getting, it's like among people who are working, so you are still getting some selection, but I think it's a little bit less. I, I think that's, because it's, it's still conditional. So if, it, if everyone was working, and it was the same people kind of working both periods, it would be totally clean. Now that I think about the explanation I just gave you, um, you still could have some selection within the spillover sample, um, but I think it's somewhat less. So the idea is that people who are interested in applying for this external job are more likely to already be in the labor force and have selected. No, it's that there's a mechanical selection effect if we pull them out of the labor force. Like the selection effect is much larger for that sample. Because I'm like literally just taking these people out. And so, uh, there's like a, a large, I think a lot, like the, the mechanical effect of who's in the labor force is much larger over there. But I, I agree actually, now that I say it, it's not perfect either. But I think that's at least the theory for why you think about it. Patrick. Why not introduce variation in the degree of the shock among villages? Oh, okay. So tell me why you'd want that, and then I'll tell you why you don't do that. Uh, maybe then you would see, well, in the first case in which you were talking about the 24%, I imagine you in the end, to make an estimation with the end, at the end of the day, you actually risk over overshooting. Overshooting, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and variation is just kind of a nice way to not only avoid that, but also uh, actually see to what extent um, it's like where it becomes uh, over the, the way you that we're talking about. Yeah. So, okay. So, so Patrick's point, just to be clear, is in, in our example, like, yeah, maybe I should do multiple shocks to, you know, in case one of them I might overshoot. So that, so with infinite sample and infinite budget, agree. The reason that they don't do that in practice is, um, is a power issue, basically. So, you know, if I if I split my sample, imagine I, you know, for this is a case by the way where your treatment costs a lot more than your control because you pay for all these jobs. So, you know, the relevant case is not sort of even like instead of half half like a, a third, a third, a third. It's probably like a quarter, a quarter control. Right, is the kind of budget, budget neutral thing to do? Uh, ap approximately, not quite, because you have fewer people employed in the smaller shock group, but let's call it roughly that. So then, um, actually, no, I take that back. That, that could be actually first order, actually, because you know, there's, there's, you have another, actually, you have another question here. Of, oh, sorry, okay, there's, there's two des experimental design issues. The first experimental design issue is, would you rat, would you, is it better to have a smaller number of villages with a big shock or more villages with a small shock. So actually that is kind of relevant. So you could, for the same price, right, I could have 100 villages with a 24% shock or 200 treatment villages with a 12% shock, right? This is the same cost, which is better. Forgetting about this issue for a second, just like general sort of straight up experiment, like forget about this more complicated issue, just straight up experimental design, which of these do you prefer? Uh, 
So does everyone understand why? Did I go over this already in this class, or like, was that in the other class that I taught this? I can't keep track. I can't keep track. Aaron, do you remember which class I went over this issue? <laughs> it's someone else, relevant to someone. Someone else, did I go explain this already with the, with the beta and the, the TSTAT thing? Yes? OK, great. Exactly. OK, then you were paying attention. Good. So, um, so, uh, so exactly, this one has higher power. So the first point is that you, the, the lower, lower shocks, you have less power. The second point is, um, kind of related to that, which is if you, if you don't know if you're going to have an effect it, or be able to detect it, it is almost always better to have like just one control group and a really big treatment group rather than an intermediate effect. And that's because um, It's like if this is the control and this is the treatment, and in general we think the response of most things is linear, to f like approximately linear, right? Then we're trying to figure out, we have this kind of small thing here, we have known of a lot of power on that small thing, and we'd be trying to sort of test, like are we kind of on this linear, like we're usually interested in like are we on this linear curve or not? and so. Like testing, you know, not just like are you, uh, you know, identifying this sort of lower range thing and sort of testing whether you're on this linear curve requires sort of a lot, a, a lot, a lot of power. So most of the time, these intermediate outcomes um, are very, very difficult to distinguish from just sort of being being on the linear, just on the linear curve. Sorry, the the reason for that actually is like you know you have less power here and you're trying to test like. You know that this is equal to that this coefficient is equal to half of that coefficient is sort of a very sort of tight test. Now, in in this that's the sort of so that's the general reason why, if you're not sure if you have an effect, like you would need a really big sample for it to make sense to do sort of these half power, uh, intermediate outcomes. In your case, that's not quite right. In this case, it's not quite right because we have this additional hypothesis, this additional issue of like maybe we're overshooting. Um, but again, the problem is uh, if you ran that test, you'd want to say, well, suppose you found in that case that in the, the only relevant case is the case where in the kind of the full one, we find labor supply and labor demand effects, and in this smaller one, we don't. That's the, that's the overshooting case, right? But then you have this other problem of, well, the treatment was also half the size. So you also have to, you'd have to rule out not only, it kind of is the same case, you have to rule out not, like, you have to, you have to rule out not only are these things different, like this one's zero and this one's not, but actually you have to also be able to, you have to reject a harder thing, which is this is not equal to just half of this effect. You see what I'm saying? Like, the, the thing you're testing is not just that this would be zero and this would be the full thing, but you also have to reject that this thing is not just half of that, because that would just be like linear. You see what I'm saying? So the amount of power that you would need to sort of like do that successfully would be pretty large. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that basically, I mean, another way of saying it is I think on these things, your best bet is, it, even though it's very, very nerve wracking as a researcher, it is often not the case that like the best thing to do is hedge your bets with sort of two different treatment effect classes. Um, and by the way, like, you know, if you see like a lot of the, um, you know the um, if you think about how they're running how they run clinical trials like if you think about like the like the, the, the COVID vaccine clinical trials which are probably the clinical trials everyone is most familiar with I'm guessing at the moment like that's what they 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 the main the first trial of like are we gonna like approve the vaccine or not they did a bunch of little small things to sort of check the dosage and make sure it was like you know seemed to be like kind of having antibody responses and not sort of being toxic or whatever and they just kind of like took their best shot and picked one protocol and ran with that for kind of the phase three trial, right? And that's, you know, so, so, and then, you know, once it worked, and then in subsequent trials, then they're starting to test different things, and then they have a much better sense of power, and also the thing works, so that they can, like, you know, but the, the very first trial of, like, is this thing gonna work? They were like, we don't know what the effect size is gonna be, so we're just gonna, like, 
max out treatment versus control and just kind of you know pick our take our best shot based on sort of the preliminary small scale studies of what we think is going to work, and that's what we're going to do for the, for the big trial and not sort of in the very first trial kind of go for multiple different strategies. As I said, once once it works, then you actually have much more information. You know how big the response is. You can plot these things much more carefully. You have much tighter priors. But for that first efficacy trial, it was just kind of like treatment versus control. And then, yeah. If you're doing, um, I guess if you go for one big group, you're not able to ask questions about dosage. But, Correct. Um, but you can ask questions about like other sorts of. I mean, I guess dosage is different than other things. But like, my point is like. Still do more than your. Uh, I'm trying to think like what subsequent analyses can you do beyond the simple like, like difference in means. What do you? Um, I, 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 you, you lose the ability to do those like plot out the effects. Of yes, the yes. You cannot do, exactly. You can't do those response. In a sentence, like what do you not lose? <laughs> I mean. If you're trading off, like if you don't do dose response, you don't, you can't do dose response. That's what you lose. I, I think that that's that's the, like that's the downside. No, so what's the gain? The gain is you're much more likely to pick up an effect, like by like a lot. That's kind of the main. Like if you're if you're just trying to say does this thing have an effect and kind of what like the first order estimate of kind of like what is the slope of the of that thing? Like you know the the first order thing is you're gonna get a lot more power on sort of identifying kind of what's going on and and rejecting the null of zero. If you do heterogeneity by the Based on like people that you think ex ante might need a larger or smaller dose. You could if you if you yeah so for like if you think of the clinical trial example if you thought that like if you yeah maybe you thought dose was proportional to weight you could sort of do like you know for example you could do that if you. So that's okay with a single. But those you know but it's not randomized heterogeneity so it's correlated with other things maybe like people who are you know whatever have different immune system or you know or whatever the equivalent is here. Okay, all right. Um, Okay, so what do they find? So they find that basically um, in the peak season, wages increase by 5%, employment declines by 21%. Um, and uh, in the slack season, basically, like, um, wages are unchanged. So the peak season looks like a competitive um, labor market uh, with elasticity of labor demand of around minus 4. Um, and, uh, and the slack season is, um, looks like a head rationing. So both of those, in some sense, that paper and the previous paper go together uh, to basically say, look, it seems like we have something kind of not clearing in the labor market, right? That nominal labor rigidity was sort of saying that, that experimental paper was sort of saying that there's something in these rural labor markets which is sort of preventing labor market clearing. So the question is sort of why, like what's going on, okay? And, 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 and how is, why is this happening? So there's a couple of recent papers which start to sort of uh, investigate this. So one, um, is uh, a, another paper by sort of a similar set of uh, co-authors, um, which runs an experiment to get at this. And here's what they do, okay? They, they go to Indian villages and they offer spot jobs. They vary the wage of the jobs. And they vary whether the wage offer is observable or not. And the way they do this is pretty subtle. They basically do it in the context of sort of a, they do a baseline survey, and they say, by the way, we're offering this job. You know, here's the wage. Would you like to do it? Um, and in some of them, they make that offer on the front porch of a person's house. So people who are, you know, and, and if any of you have ever done a survey in a developing country context, it's often pretty common for other people to kind of crowd around and sort of listen to what's going on. It's pretty exciting. Like, you know, some person's here doing a survey. Like, let's listen in. So they do that on the front porch. Or they say, let's please, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it inside your house. So it's in private. So it's exactly the same, but just varying kind of whether it's like on your front porch or in private. Okay. Um, so those are the those are the three treatments. And so what would you what would you expect from this? You're more likely to accept a lower wage in private than why? Pride. Huh? Pride, essentially. Okay. So any other theories of why? Yeah. I, I guess there's also, if there's kind of like a, I, I guess the, the analogy I have in my mind is like, you know, like a scab, basically like accepting a lower wage when people are kind of like, I, you know, if there's, if there's like this agreed upon social norm that we're not going to work for more than X and you're kind of like undercutting other people. Right. And if, 
And in fact, the, the very first draft of this paper was titled Scabs, and then they changed the title. Um, uh, in part to acknowledge kind of there were other things, I think, going on. But yeah, so one theory is kind of like this social, external social norm theory that basically like, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure that's going on to sort of prevent, that, that sort of enforce these higher wages, right? And so any individual is going to get social sanctions if they kind of accept lower wage. And the other is your theory that like I kind of, this is like an internal thing and I'm not going to do it, right? So, uh, and, but the internal one would have to be sort of like only my pride vis-a-vis -vis other people. Like it's not my internal pride, it's that, it's that I ha people are sort of watching me. Yeah, I think this is maybe a little better articulation of the dynamic that I have. What's that? Th this is maybe a slightly better articulation of the dynamic I that I have in mind. Got it. Okay, so there's something going, right? And so, um, by the way, can you imagine, like, it, are there cases where it would be optimal, maybe, for the village to, like, have these norms? Like monopsony, even a wage Yeah, exactly, right? So if there's monopsony power, local market power, it's like, exactly, it's kind of bargaining with the, with the firm, and, or in general, if there's any kind of rents, right, we might want to sort of extract some of those rents, and so that we might want to keep the wage artificially high, and sort of like that might mean whenever we keep the wage artificially high, you know, there's a little bit of surplus. You know, individuals might want to deviate, um, but but uh, we're all kind of trying to keep the wage the wage high to kind of extract rents together, right? So it's kind of a collective action model. Okay, and here's the result. It's like super simple. Um, uh, the result is th this is like the main result. So. This is probability of taking up the wage at kind of the going market wage at 10% less the going market wage when in public, I'm sorry, in private, and 10% less than the market wage in public. Okay, so it's pretty stark. So basically, almost nobody is willing to, um, and sorry, this is in this, like the high unemployment periods and low unemployment periods. In the high unemployment period, basically lots of people want this job. Right, because there's a lot the, the, that that thing is the, the labor market is really that that gap is kind of large. In the low unemployment periods, the gap is kind of small, and so maybe actually we don't care that much, right? So in these periods over here, that's the one kind of consistent with uh, what what Sean was suggesting, which is basically like we're 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 in, in we're in a market where the wage is too high, right? We'd all like to get jobs, so, so there's some un, there's some failure of market clearing. Um, and, uh, and so people are like, if you can do it in private, you're happy to take it, but you don't want to do it in public because you're sort of worried about um, retaliation or whatever. And in fact, one thing that's kind of nice is, this is too small for you to read, but you can see it in your handout. They ask people uh, what's going on, and there are sort of various sort of, um, uh, or what you, would, what you would do, sorry, to, to a worker who would like, you know, took one of these jobs or whatever, right? You would like try to convince them not to. You would like impose social sanctions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You try to exclude them from other labor market op opportunities, et cetera. Or, or, or you know, what did you know? So, so in general, um, you know, there are. Uh, it looks like people are, there. There are sort of these public punishments for sort of breaking these wage norms. Okay, and that, so that's the beginning of, 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 a, of an explanation for sort of how we might be getting these labor market sort of failures of clearing. Right, we have these kind of prevailing wage norms. You know, those wages kind of move around, right, and then they stay, they sort of stay high, uh, potentially as a way of sort of getting some rents. You know, is it efficient? It's actually, you know, that, to that question, I'm not sure we have a clear answer from all these papers of whether or not this is like collectively efficient for these villagers or not. Um, whether the additional sort of, you know, additional rents they're getting kind of exceed the, the, the unemployment. You might be able to calculate that from these papers. I don't remember them actually doing that, but that's something to, to think about as well. Okay, so it looks like actually what's, so stepping way back, it looks like these labor markets are actually kind of, you know, what's going on is kind of nuanced, right? You're having these failures of labor market clearing, you have these social sanctions that are sort of like a potentially sort of a impeding that. Okay, questions? So the final set of topics on labor supply that I want to talk about uh, are, I, I won't get to finish them, but I'll start them, is some papers about sort of like, you know, I would say like, Poverty and behavioral issues in labor supply. Okay, so um, which is to say, um, you know, so so one issue that we talked about in general was sort of having these labor market frictions. Um, you know, there may be other sort of reasons. There may be other things that are sort of affecting kind of these rural labor markets due to the fact that these people are really poor. And so, how, how can we think about those issues? And so, I want to explore. Um, 
four different kind of related issues, which will take us to mostly to the next. I'll do this one today, and then the rest of them we'll do the next time. So the first is sort of like, so these questions are sort of how does poverty affect our labor supply decisions? One argument is it sort of basic consumption needs basically change the elasticity of labor supply, and that can have aggregate implications. A second is sort of like a behavioral channel where sort of poverty and sort of needing to sort of think about, you know, your, how you're going to meet your daily, your daily poverty needs change your productivity and directly. We'll talk about identity and labor supply issues, and then actually we'll talk about uh, a new paper on the cognitive benefits of work. Okay, so. Um, so the first paper I just want to mention about poverty and labor supply is a paper by Seema Jaya Chandran. And the idea here is very simple. Her idea is that, that basically workers have minimum consumption needs. Okay? And if you're really poor or you have inability to smooth shocks across periods or to borrow or, or do anything to smooth, that's going to make your labor supply less elastic. Okay? Uh, and it's going to be less elastic if there's less access to credit or, or less ability to migrate or whatever. And less elastic wages are going to mean that there's a pecuniary externality from you to sort of other people. So in particular, right, if we contrast a labor market where uh, labor supply is kind of elastic and looks like this, that's elastic, to one that looks like this, labor supply inelastic, imagine what happens when we have sort of a negative labor supply shock, right? When we have a negative labor supply shock, if labor supply is inelastic, the wage is going to fall more than if it's elastic, right? And what that means is that there's a, there's a negative externality, a pecuniary externality, which is an externality that happens through sort of prices, of having a lot of poor people around you, OK? So even if we hold my own sort of ability to smooth shocks constant, if I'm surrounded by people who are sort of unable to smooth shocks, they're going to be more inelastic. And that means that the aggregate wage that I'm facing is going to fall more in these net negative periods. Is that clear? OK. Actually, I'm out of time now. So I'll, I'll pick up by just sort of starting with the empirics of this next time. And then we'll go through these other papers on labor supply. And I'm going to try, since I'm running a little bit behind, to finish up the labor supply, the, sorry, the labor lecture uh, next class so that we can have uh, spend next week on credit.